right. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. You know, some of you have criticized this channel by saying, can you stop ranting about the Fed, stocks, inflation, and the economy, bro? We're sick and tired already. Talk about something else. Talk about something new. Okay, let's talk about something new, like the great debate, fresh cranberry sauce or canned cranberry sauce. And as you can see, America voted and ironically the South and the Northeast of this country agrees that canned is the way to go. I guess Lincoln could have solved the Civil War by handing out canned cranberry sauce, but anyhow, see I still got my Southern roots since I used to live in Murfreesboro, Tennessee which is a great place to live if you got nothing to do. But anyways, I used to collect horse manure from farms in the outskirts of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and this is how I started my fertilizer empire. It's a great business model. All you have to do is ask, may I pick up your livestock poop? And some of them might even uh, ask you, should we pay you something? And that ends up being like the scene from Catch Me If You Can when DiCaprio scams the hooker into paying him for some action. Although with minor differences in that inconveniences, shall we say. This business model is of course not as good as the smash and grab business model. That's where the real money is. But if Miss Fresh Cranberry Sauce was to run against Mr. Canned Cranberry Sauce, according to the Electoral College, Miss Fresh Cranberry Sauce will be elected the next president of the United States. Although Mr. Cranberry Sauce would complain about election fraud due to the shortage in aluminum cans. Regardless whether it is Mrs. Fresh Cranberry Sauce or Mr. Canned Cranberry Sauce, they would do a better job than the clowns that we have right now in politics. I mean, the outcome will be the same. You and I will die from diabetes. In the case of the Cranberry Party, you and I will die from extra sweetness. And in the case of the Republicans and Democrats, you and I will die from the lack of affordable health care. Anyhow, oh now you want me to talk about inflation and the economy, huh? You know, some of you criticize the channel for being too negative and scary. You urge me to look into the half full part of the glass. Okay, here's a good inflation story for you, and it is almost a fairy tale. You know what Dr. Friedman said about inflation? Inflation is just like alcoholism. In both cases, when you start drinking, or when you start printing too much money. The good effects come first, the bad effects only come later. That's why in both cases there's a strong temptation to overdo it, to drink too much and to print too much money. When it comes to the cure it's the other way around. When you stop drinking or when you stop printing money, the bad effects come first and the good effects only come later. That's why it's so hard to persist with the cure. So yeah, there is a lot of good in the beginning stages of inflation. Example, wage gains for workers, which we know eventually will get cancelled by living expenses increases, and after inflation blows up the economy, you lose your job anyways. But in the meantime, you and I are taught in this capitalist propaganda system that paying employees a living wage is not good for business, because it hurts profits. And I say bullshit, which puts me in a disagreement, with Dr. Friedman, but I remember a day in America where we were allowed to agree and disagree with someone without having to cancel or block them. So yes, I agree with Dr. Friedman about inflation, but I disagree with him about labor issues. But for now, inflation combined with a historic labor shortage is emboldening employees and labor across the country to demand better wages and working conditions. Labor, in essence, is seizing on this rare and historic opportunity to turn the table against evil corporate America. Matter of fact, we're having a contagious labor strike across the country. And of course, your beloved media is not giving the story its fair share of coverage, because God forbid it upsets their corporate overlords and sponsors. But here are examples of the labor strikes that took place, and some still going on in the nation. Kellogg's Around 1,400 workers at the company's cereal plants have been on strike since October over what they say is an unfair pay and benefit system. We are going to hold our lines throughout the dead of the winter, if we have to, said Dan Osborne, a striking Kellogg's worker. We worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day throughout COVID to get Kellogg's to earn the record profits. Nabisco, the maker of Oreos, Red's Crackers, and Triscuits, faced a 40-day strike by 1,000 workers, a movement that ultimately won employees $5,000 bonuses and annual raises and boosted contributions to employees' 401k accounts. 
And then we have GoPuff, drivers and warehouse workers at the $15 billion snack delivery company in Philadelphia blocked access points to the facility over pay errors and reduced pay. And then we have Chipotle. Chipotle employees in New York City fought for better working conditions by protesting against the chain's burrito promotion, where burritos ordered online were discounted by five bucks. A holiday BOGO deal in July had caused chaos in Chipotle locations across the country. And workers used Halloween promotions to advocate against overwork, abrupt schedule changes. And then we have John Deere. The month-long strike held by hundreds, make that thousands actually, of John Deere employees ended in a modest win for employees, with the union securing additional bonuses, tweaks to a system used to calculate bonuses, and the preservation of a health insurance program that did not require workers to pay premiums. And then we have the frat house, Activision Blizzard, employees at the video game giant staged two walkouts over claims of harassment and pay inequity and demanded that embattled CEO f face resign amid claims that he was aware of the sexual harassment and the R ward allegations for years. And even McDonald's. The fast food giant employees in 10 different cities planned one day strike to protest rampant sexual harassment in stores. The strikes were organized by the advocacy group Fight for 15 after a McDonald's manager in Pittsburgh was charged with the R ward of a 14 year old female worker. What about American Airlines? Flight attendants at the Piedmont Airline, one of American Airlines' largest regional carriers, unanimously voted to strike over high health premiums and low pay compared to mainline flight attendants. And then we have Netflix. Trans Netflix employees staged a company-wide walkout on October 20, after Netflix's co-CEO defended Dave Chappelle's Netflix special, where the comedian made transphobic jokes. And rumor has it, Netflix fad employees were also planning to strike against the company for Dave Chappelle's fad jokes. And the management of Netflix said, okay, we'll fire Dave Chappelle if you guys take a hike. And the strike was canceled, of course. These are all jokes meant for comedic purposes, of course. No harm intended. I myself participating in the fat movement. Matter of fact, my wife calls me garbage disposal. But you know what? You can make fun of us all you want. When the upcoming famine happens, uh, the fat will survive because we're storing all of that energy, right? The skinny folks, they're going to die right away. But the fat folks they will outlive them because they got the energy stored. See how smart we are? Anyhow, what about GE? Over 200 GE employees walked out of, uh, whatever that is, New York. Schenectady. Yep, that's what she said. But anyhow, the workers walked out on October 24 in protest of the company's vaccine mandate. And then we have Kaiser. 60,000 of the healthcare company's nurses and healthcare workers went on a sympathy strike on Thursday and Friday to support the 700 stationary and biomedical engineers who have been striking for months for better pay. Then we have special medals. 450 steelworkers have been on the picket line for over a month in their strike over a contract that offered pay cuts and higher health care premiums. As the strike drags on, many have had to take on second jobs and fall back on donations from the community. What about Warrior Medcall? A seven-month-long strike by thousands of miners over unfair labor practices has cost the company six Point nine million dollars. And then we have ArcelorMittal. 500 workers at the multinational steel company walked out on November 1st over stagnating pension growth, a seven-day work week, and rising premiums. Then we have Heaven Hell. 400 employees at the Bourbon and Spirit Distillery secured increases in wages and company contributions to employees' health care plans, as well as 40-hour cap on the working hours per week after a six-week-long strike. We also have workers at 10 different healthcare companies. Thousands of healthcare workers across the country staged strikes this fall over issues ranging from staffing to dangerous working conditions. But perhaps the most important labor strike, and I would argue in recent American history, is the Deer Strike by UAW, a mini labor revolution. 
that the media failed to cover properly. Why? Because it is a labor movement that brought white, black, brown, Republican, Democrat, independent together to fight for better wages and treatment from their corporate overlords. These laborers knew that Deer is thriving under this inflationary environment, with record profits reflected in executive bonuses and share buybacks. And these laborers looked around and asked, where's our taste? How come we're not getting anything out of this? How come these historic profits are not trickling down to us? And they orchestrated one of the most historic and smartest labor strikes in American history. And here is the backdrop. The five-week strike by more than 10,000 UAW members was the first against the Moulin, Illinois company in 35 years. And of course, if you're a politician in Moulin, Illinois, you should consider changing the name to Moulin, Illinois. That way you can get some of that Disney money. You can't rely on dear money only. Anyhow, the production of tractors, harvesting combines, Crop sprayers, construction wheel loaders, and other equipment slowed significantly during that period. Non-union employees and supervisors manning plants shipped equipment that was mostly completed before the walkout. What are the conditions that Deere is going through right now that enabled these workers and these union members to strike against the company? Here it is. Continued strong demand for farm and construction machinery should help Deere backfill lost production and sales caused by the walkout. The U.S. Department of Agriculture in September projected net farm income would surge 20% this year to $113 billion, the highest since 2013. Farmers typically spend extra income on equipment because they can deduct those purchases from their federal income taxes as business investment. U.S. retail sales volumes of high horsepower tractors and combines industry-wide are up 23% and 24% respectively. And this is of course for this year throughout October, when you compare it to last year. Deer resolved the strike as it heads into what is traditionally the high season for farm equipment sales. So the labor struck when it hurt the most. They knew exactly what they were doing. The timing was important here. As farmers make purchases ahead of the growing season, with many corn and soybean producers flush with cash from higher commodity prices, dealers are anticipating heavy business year or heavy business by year's end. Deer started its early ordering program in August. For next year's equipment models. In the next 45 days, there will be lots of equipment swapped, said Rob Shelton, an account manager for Greenway Equipment, a deer dealer in Arkansas. Then he added, two of our busiest months are December and January. The strike, which straddled the end of the company's fiscal fourth quarter in October, and the start of the first quarter of fiscal 2022 in November likely sliced Deer's production by 10 to 15 percent in both its fourth and first quarters. These are the experts, of course, the analysts. They say that the strike was bad for Deer. The strike tempered the expectations for Deer's fourth quarter as the consensus estimate for earnings per share slipped to $3.87 from $4.8, 4 bucks and 8 cents that is, in late September. Analysts anticipate equipment sales of $10.5 billion, which would be a 20% increase from the same period last year. So the analysts, their expectations were down. This is going to hurt deer. Raising wages, labor strikes, they're bad for business. And here's the deal, by the way, the details of the deal. Deer workers returning to assembly plants and warehouses will get an immediate 10% raise, and each worker will receive an $8,500 bonus. Additional 5% pay raises will be provided in 2023 and 2025, and lump sum bonuses amounting to 3% of workers' annual pay will be rewarded in the three other years. So when Fed Chairman Jerome Powell says inflation is transitory, yeah, maybe like six years. That's transitory. Anyhow, the deal approved Wednesday will also increase the base level, the base pay level for Deer's continuous improvement program by about 4%, giving workers more weekly pay from the program if their productivity meets the company's goals. About two-thirds of the UAW represented Deer workers received production-based compensation on top of the regular wages, according to the company. So Deer reported earnings yesterday. Today. And the stock must have crashed, right? Companies' profits must have crashed due to this deal, right? Because when you pay your workers a fair wage, that's bad for business. That's what we're taught. 
in schools and colleges, the media, yada, yada, yada. Here's the truth, though. Dear Post's profit surge on soaring farming income. Deer and Co. surpassed market estimates for quarterly profit on Wednesday as a surge in crop and livestock prices encouraged farmers to splurge on tractors and combines. The results sent shares of the world's largest farm equipment maker 3% higher in pre-market trading. Make that 6% because Deer traded as high as 6% yesterday and eased some fears around the impact of a worker strike that had hit Deer's operation for about three weeks in the fourth quarter. Higher corn and soybean prices this year have brightened the financial outlook for farmers, with the U.S. Department of Agriculture projecting net farm income to rise 19.5% to an eight-year high of $113 billion in 2021. Now listen to this. That has driven up sales of farm equipment despite price hikes by manufacturers. Deer sales of its large and some medium equipment jumped 23% in the quarter, while sales of smaller farm and turf equipment rose 17%. So much for the damage from the labor strike and wage increases. The Illinois-based company also signaled the boom was expected to continue, forecasting 2021 earnings between $6.5 billion and $7 billion. The midpoint range was higher than the analysts' estimates of 6 6.72 billion. And I know what you're going to say, but what about the next quarter, bro? What about next year? These wage increases are going to hurt Deer and they're going to destroy the company and yada, yada, yada. Deer's financial outlook for the next year signals that global supply chain delays and higher labor costs following a month long strike in the U.S. won't, once again, won't significantly dent profits at the world's largest farm equipment maker. And why is that, by the way? Back to the article from the Wall Street Journal. Low inventories of new and used farm equipment in North America and supply chain disruptions have kept rival companies or rival equipment makers from ramping up their production to chip away at Deere's leading share of the high horsepower farm equipment market. They also said, these are the analysts, of course, the tight market gives Deere the ability to charge higher prices, at least in the short term, to recover some of its higher labor expenses from the new contract. And here's the important part, by the way, which Deere said it will cost $3.5 billion over the course of the six-year contract. That's the price tag. Three and a half billion dollars. How much did the company make in profits again? Labor accounts for about 15% of Deere's overall cost of goods sold, analysts said. The 10% pay raise and 8500 bucks bonuses that each UAW member will receive and raises awarded to non-union employees as well are expected to cost Deere about $235 million in the first year of the contract. And pay attention now. This is according to an analyst from Jefferies. He also estimates that the higher cost will shave nearly 1%, again, 1 percentage point, of Deere's operating margin. All of these increases, oh my God, the company's gonna collapse for paying employees a living wage. All of that is only 1% in operating margins. Those profits could be easily recovered by higher prices or greater output at Deere's factories. Deere increased prices on large farm equipment by about 8% during its just concluded fiscal year. The company said. So the moral of the story here, beside the fact that inflation is not transitory, is from an investor's point of view, does this scare you at all? Does the increase in wages and benefits drive away investors at all? Of course not. If anything, this was a demonstration of power by Deere that even if their input costs increase by higher wages, they can easily offset that by slightly higher prices on farmers. Or by the way, enjoying a Venezuela-like socialist system by the government, it's a win-win situation, contrary to what you've been taught that if a company pays its worker better wages and benefits, it's bad for business. If anything, Deere's profit soared as a result. I understand that this example cannot be replaced in other struggling companies or small businesses that cannot afford wage hikes. I have a different view on small businesses and how they should not be treated with the same blanket as big corporations from a taxation and subsidies standpoint. Small businesses are the heart of this economy, and the rules should be bended to their advantage, not to the advantage of large public enterprises like we have right now, 
we can discuss my views and approach to small businesses in another video. The moral of this story is, labor has risen against corporate greed, and labor won. And you know what? It only cost the company 1% in operating profits, which was easily made up for, and then some. And this is a story that the hyper-capitalist propaganda machine in this country will never cover in the matter just like I did, because it doesn't fit the narrative. Congratulations to UAW workers who organized the strike. You won a decent deal and you were rational and not greedy. You could have prolonged the strike and demanded higher pays, even higher than what you got. But you were rational and reasonable. You are an inspiration to all of us. And also, congratulations to Deer on an excellent quarter and many more to come. This is just one positive story from this inflation. You're not going to see a lot of them because inflation is bad in the grand scheme of things. It hurts the poor, the middle class, and small businesses the most. But the silver lining here is that we have labor rising against public corporations who had it so good for a long time. And they're having it so good right now due to the free cash from the Federal Reserve, the loose money that favors these large enterprises and their stocks, of course. But labor is seizing the opportunity. They're winning for now. And you know what? It is not hurting some of these companies. They can still afford to pay their workers better wages and benefits and enjoy higher profits not lower. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now. I gotta go cook right now, and I'm not having any help by the B-roll flavor statistics, by the way. So I gotta say goodbye, but thank you for watching, thank you for listening, and I will talk to you again soon.